Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Ronald Reagan in tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of a man who wanted to apologize for threatening a stranger. And when he got there, the stranger was dead and the police were waiting. It's called Circumstantial Terror. Our star, Mr. Ronald Reagan. This is Harlow Wilcox with a $100,000 reminder. That total will be given to recognized charities in cash through the Autolite family charity drawing. And you may be one of 25 persons selected to name your own church, hospital, or any other local or national recognized charity to share in this huge sum. There's no obligation except printing your name and address, but your favorite recognized charity may share in thousands of dollars. To tell you how important this is to his organization, we are privileged to present General George Kenney, president of the Arthritis and Rheumatism Foundation. This generous Autolite offer will greatly aid the work of such groups as the Arthritis and Rheumatism Foundation. If you are one of the 25 persons chosen to name your favorite organization, I hope you will remember the 10 million people who suffer the pain and the crippling of arthritis. They will be most grateful for your help. Good luck to you in this Autolite family charity drawing. To enter this drawing, just visit any of these Autolite family car showrooms and fill out a registration form. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. It may mean thousands to your favorite recognized charity. So sign up tomorrow. And now, Autolite presents Circumstantial Terror, starring Mr. Ronald Reagan, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. I wasn't the only one who was mad at him. All the other guys felt just about like I did. About Curly Weber, that is. You see, if he hadn't let the pressure go too high, we'd have all been in good shape right now. As it was, the boiler blew up and wrecked the cleaning plant where I worked. The owner collected the insurance money and got out of the business, which left us with no jobs. After a few months of looking around for a job, I was in a pretty bad way. Then I connected. Only trouble was it wouldn't start for three weeks. By now I was broke, irritable, and mad at the world. So I wasn't what you'd call a pleasant type fellow when I walked into this liquor store for a package of smokes about 11 o'clock one night. So, what else could I do, Eddie? There I was with egg on my face and that phony salesman telling me I was going to have to take what he gives me or get nothing at all. What do you have to buy from him for? His outfit has the distributor tied up. 25% of what I make, I make from his scotch. I'd like a pack of cigarettes. Hold your horses, mister. I got another customer. So, I check around town to see if maybe I can get the scotch somewhere else. How'd you make out? Go ahead. Take a guess. Come on, mister. Get off the dime. Just give What's me a... What's the matter with you? Ain't you got no manners? Just give me a pack of cigarettes and stop shooting off your mouth. Me shooting off my mouth? Look, buster, I got a pretty good trade right now, so why don't you take your two-bit sale somewhere else? I don't even like the way you look. Listen, smart guy. I've taken a lot of lip from guys like you in the last few months. One more crack out of you and I'll smear you all over the joint, do you hear? All right, mister. All right. Take it easy. Sam don't mean no harm. That's just the way he talks. Then let him talk to somebody else like that. Hey, why don't you give me cigarettes, Sam? We can talk some more after he leaves. Oh, okay. What kind do you want, mister? I don't want any kind. I just want you to remember something. Next time you see me, you'd better cross over to the other side of the street. It'll be healthier for you. Remember that. I went back to my room and poured myself a drink. No doubt about it, I'd acted like a fool. But four months of being unemployed didn't exactly develop an even temper. It was a half hour before I realized I still hadn't got any cigarettes, and another 15 minutes before I could talk myself into going back to the liquor store to apologize for losing my temper. The street was dark, and the only light on the whole block came from the glowing window of the liquor store. I still wasn't sure what I was going to say to Sam when I got there. 
And I knew I'd fix everything up all right. I'd gotten to within about 100 feet of the store when I noticed a black or what seemed to be black coupe parked in front of the store. Just about the time I noticed it, I heard a shot. It seemed to come from the direction of the store. I stopped for a second. Then a guy rushed out of the store right in front of me, jumped into the car, and before I could do anything, it roared down the darkened street out of sight. I ran to the store and looked in. Nobody around. And I looked behind the counter. The guy I'd argued with, Sam, was on the deck. I could tell right away that it was a waste of time to check his pulse, but I did it anyway. He was dead, all right. Then I started for the door to call the cops. Hey, what's going on? Oh, oh, what did I tell you, Irv? I saw who did it. He ran out the door as I was coming up the street. Come on. Grab him, Irv. He did it. That's the guy I was telling you about. Come on, buddy. Let go. I tell you, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I saw the guy that did. Let go. Hold on to him, Irv. That's the guy Sam had to throw out of the store. He was casing the joint. That's what he was doing. Let go of him. Hold him good, Irv. I'm going for the cop. Don't worry. He ain't going nowhere. Just as I was getting up to go after the police, these two guys rush in and hold me. I didn't do it, I tell you. He's lying, officer. We'll find out if he's lying when the guys from Homicide get here. I don't even own a gun. That gun laying by Sam's body is Sam's gun. Looks to me like this guy shot him with his own gun. If you don't shut your mouth... Easy does it. What happens when the guys from Homicide get here? You want my honest opinion, mister? Yeah, sure. I didn't put the cuffs on you for laughs. I think you've had it, buddy. It's only an opinion, but from what I can see here and what I've gotten from these witnesses, you're nail, buddy. Nail good. And I was. By the time it was presented to the grand jury, the state had a real good case prepared against me. The liquor store owner's gun only had his prints on it, which made it look as if I'd tried a phony hold up and jumped him when he drew it. And there was money scattered all over the store, which made it look as if I'd been surprised before I had a chance to get away. That guy, Eddie, who'd been in the store when I had my argument, wouldn't let me up. He pounded nails in my coffin every time he opened his mouth. If I'd had a job when all this happened, that I had trouble giving me a motive. And being broke and unemployed made it look that much worse. As a result, I wasn't surprised when the grand jury came through with an indictment for first-degree murder. As far as I was concerned, it was all over but the hanging. Now, how are you? You, uh, Frank Thompson? Right now, I wish I weren't, but I am. Who are you? I'm Ernest Gibbons. I've been assigned as public defender in your case. You're wasting your time. Why? Are you guilty? No, I'm not. Well, then I'm not wasting my time. <clears throat> Mind if I sit down? Go ahead. Well, I think I got most of the facts straight in my mind. Now, I want you to tell me in your own words what happened. Did you read the transcript of the inquest? Yes, I did. That's all there is to it. Uh-huh. Well, look, Frank, I'm here to help you if I can. Now, don't make it tough for me. I think we can beat this if you help me. How? Well, first, let's forget that story about running in after the storekeeper was shot. Now, nobody believes that. Would you believe it if I tell it to you again? Should I? Yes, because it's the truth. Well, can you describe the man you saw running out? More or less. Well, what do you mean by more or less? Well, I got a pretty good look at his face. He had a mustache. But I couldn't tell you how tall he was or how much he weighed. It seemed to me to be just medium all around. Uh, how well, you said at the inquest that he got in a car and he drove... Now, can you describe the car? It was a black coupe. Uh, what year? Don't know. How about the make? I couldn't tell. It was too dark. Mm-hmm. But the license number, all or any part of the license number? None of it. All his lights were out. Uh-huh. In other words, if you wanted to lie, this would be a pretty good way of blaming someone the police couldn't possibly track down, wouldn't it? I guess so. But I'm not lying. All right, now let's see. The state has set the trial for a week from today. In a hurry, aren't they? <laughs> well, I guess they figure that they've got you sewed up. The papers have public opinion running pretty high against you. You know, the man left a wife and three little kids. Well, that's tough. Real tough. <laughs> It was a couple of days later that Ernie came to me and said they were selecting the jurors who'd hear the case. This was a part of the law I didn't know a thing about, so when he said I had a right to sit in on the selection, I went along, only to get out of the cell for a few hours. 
Well, to put it simply, it's more of an interview than anything else. It also gives us a chance to get jurors we think might be more easily swayed to our way of thinking. <clears throat> I'm to the point where I don't care much one way or another. I just wanted to get out of the cell for a little while. Maybe I'd be better off if I just plead guilty and get it over with. Oh, now you're talking foolish, boy. There's a lot that can happen in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and it's all going to happen to me. <laughs> Some of it might be good, you know. Don't hold your breath. Well, over here, Frank. Just sit down right there. Okay. I'm going to try to get as many women as I can on the jury. You're a pretty good-looking boy. It helps sometimes. What about the prosecution? Don't they have anything to say about it? Well, I doubt if they challenge more than once or twice. Now, they think they have such a strong case, it doesn't matter much to them who's on the jury. They're right, too, aren't they? Now, that remains to be seen. <clears throat> uh -huh, here they come. Yeah. Right now, I'd trade places with any given one of them. I don't think you'd get any takers. <laughs> oh, well, they're not as many women as I'd like to have seen. Ernie. Ernie. What's up, boy? The guy with the gray suit. Where? Over there, next to the dame with the fur coat. Oh, yeah. Well, what about him? Don't challenge him. What? Don't challenge him. That's the guy. What guy? That's the guy that killed the shopkeeper. That's the guy I saw running out of the store that night. Get him on the jury. Don't let him get away. I don't want to die for what he did. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ronald Reagan in Circumstantial Terror. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense. Uh, hey, Charlie, what Nash model is this? Well, this is the new Nash Statesman, Harlow. You know, this year, Nash offers the widest range of models and prices in history. And you can get such optional features as power steering, power brakes, and even power lift windows. And of course, Harlow, Nash has Autolite equipment, too. And Autolite is proud of its long association with Nash and Nash dealers everywhere. That's why we're privileged to salute Nash as a distinguished member of our Autolite family. Distinguished is the word for the new Nash Harlow and advanced, too. The 1954 Nash gives you greater safety with exclusive unitized Nash air flight construction, greater economy on regular gasoline, greater comfort with a new exclusive Nash all-weather eye air conditioning system that heats, ventilates, and cools at your command. And Harlow, next week, Nash introduces a completely new kind of car. Watch for it. Okay, Charlie, and thanks for the ride. Always a pleasure, Harlow, especially in a new Nash. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Ronald Reagan in Elliot Lewis's production of Circumstantial Terror, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> It was tough sitting through the selection of the jury, especially when I knew that the prosecution could, for no apparent reason, disqualify the man I'd pointed out to Ernie. If he was the man I'd seen run out of the liquor store the night of the shooting, then he had to be where we could keep tabs on him. Ernie sacrificed a couple of his limited number of preemptory challenges just to make sure the guy came up for selection. When he did, there was no objection on either side, and we had him. Later that afternoon, when Ernie came to my cell, we tried to figure out what we were going to do with him. Well, now that we've got him, uh, what are we going to do with him? Well, that's your job to figure out, Ernie. You're the lawyer. Yeah, we're no better off now than we were at the beginning. We haven't got a shrewd of evidence to substantiate your claim. Well, I saw him. Isn't that enough? Well, you're on trial, not him. Well, supposing I get up in court and say he's the man, what would happen? He'd probably declare it a mistrial and discharge the jury. And go to work on another trial, but you'd stay in jail. Wouldn't they question him? Maybe. It was pretty obvious he'd say you were off your rocker. Remember, Frank, you're the one who's accused. Defending yourself by accusing him just on your say-so is pretty flimsy. Who'd believe it, would you? 
Well, couldn't you do it? Couldn't you tell someone? Proof, Frank. Proof. What can I possibly do but quote you? What am I going to do? Just what we're doing. Go through with this trial. Then I'll appeal, no matter what the verdict is, and see if we can rope our friend into making a mistake. But he'll duck as soon as the trial's over, won't he? Probably, but at least uh, he'll be around while the trial is on. Now, if you cause a mistrial... He'll be gone a lot faster. It isn't fair. I know he's This the is man. a court of law. The burden of proof is on the accuser. What real proof have they got against me? They don't have to catch a man in the act of murder to convict him of it. Circumstantial evidence can be strong enough. And, and in your case, it seems to be. It's driving me nuts to think that this guy's got to help send me away for a murder he committed. Yeah, they haven't sensed you yet, boy. Let's see what happens. And if it does happen? Maybe we'll have something I can use to ask for a new trial. If we get into trouble. Where's the trial going to be? Well, Judge Thurston will preside, I think. Let me see, that'll put it in the uh, City Hall Annex. Where's that? In the Annex, that's a small building on the north side of the City Hall. That's uh, next to the parking lot. Why? Just asking, that's all. Frank? Yeah? Don't try any grandstand plays. Any tangle with the jury might result in a mistrial, and I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. I won't mess with them. That's good. Well, yeah, I gotta get going. Going home? Well, I guess so. Tell me something, Ernie. Sure. Well, what do you want to know? What are my chances, Ernie? And don't kid me. I wouldn't kid you, Frank. I, I don't know right now, but uh, I'd sure be lying if I said they were good. Thanks. That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> That's what I liked about Ernie. When you asked for the truth, he gave it to you. After he left, I lay back in my cot and thought about the whole mess. Everything had happened so fast, I really hadn't had time to take stock of my position. Now I did. And what I came up with made me want to beat my brains out against the steel bars out of sheer frustration. It wasn't anybody's fault. If you discounted the guy that actually did the killing, I didn't have any beef with the law or the people who were carrying out the law. It was just that they didn't know they were going to convict an innocent man. For hours, I guess I lay there thinking about ways to clear myself. Most of the ways were more daydreaming than anything else. I finally came up with the conclusion that anything I did was going to have to really go from the time I started it. There wouldn't be time for talk or reason. In the morning, I got dressed and ready for the first day of the trial. When I got to the courtroom, I was seated beside Ernie. Then came the time when papers were being shuffled and everyone was getting set for the opening arguments. Now, then you take it easy, Frank. We're going to fight real hard. You know what a backfire is? You mean like when a car... No, I mean like when you're caught in a bad brush fire without any water. Uh, Well, I'm not with you, kid. Uh, What are you going for? You light another fire downwind, let it give you a big burn spot to stand in while the main fire goes past. Uh, You explain it to me later, Frank. The judge will be here in a minute or two, and I want to get my paper straightened here. (laughs) He doesn't like to see an unprepared attorney. Listen to me, Ernie. I'm in the path of a real big fire right now. I know you are, boy. I know, but what... So I gotta try a backfire. A guy can get killed in a backfire, but at least you gotta take a chance. What are you trying to tell me? Now, say it fast, because... You'll hear from me. Stick with me, Ernie. I'm a pretty good guy, but I'm in real bad trouble. And I'm the only guy that can get me out of it. What what are you gonna do? This! Look out! He's making a break! Get out of my... Wait! the only thing I could do. I couldn't sit by while 12 people tried to make up their minds whether I must die for a murder I didn't commit. As I went out the window, I folded my arms in front of my face to keep from being cut to ribbons with a broken glass. I lit feet first in the parking lot and started running. I didn't know where I was going. All I knew was I had to get away fast. By the time everyone got organized, I'd pretty well lost myself in the alleys of the city. I got to a place where they were putting up an office building and ducked into the sub-basement, crawled into a corner and stayed there. Somewhere around midnight, I slid out and started for the only guy in town I knew wouldn't turn me in as soon as he saw me, Ernie Gibbons. When I got there, his place had a light on in the kitchen, so I went around the back. Hi, Ernie. Let me in. Well, 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 come on, hurry. What are you doing here? 
If they find out about this, I'll be disbarred. I won't stay long. Wait till I turn the light off. Now sit right there, Frank. And don't move around too much. Thanks. Okay. Tell me why you did it. I told you this morning in court. This is my backfire. I couldn't just stand around while they made up their minds whether to kill me or let me rot in jail. I didn't do it. I'm going to get the guy that did. Oh, then they'll really have you. And they'll have me for something I did, not something I didn't do. Well, why'd you come here? I need an address. An address? You mean the guy with the mustache? Yeah. Got anything on him? He isn't around, Frank. How do you know? By the time I got through with the mess you left behind, it was pretty late in the day. What are you talking about? Just this. We knew he'd duck out as soon as the trial was over. But during the trial, we might have been able to work something. That's why I warned you about causing a mistrial. Well, this afternoon, I went over to the address he'd given. And he moved out a few hours after your break. Any forwarding address? Oh, don't be so naive. The man is a murderer. I don't think he knows you saw him running out of the store. But he isn't taking any chances. He's lost, Frank. And you're in a bigger jam than before. What do I do now? Oh, yes, you tell me. I won't give myself up. Well, that's up to you. You're on your own now. What's your position in this? Well, I should turn you in. But you won't. Oh, you're a cinch. They have the book thrown at you when they get you. I gotta think. Yeah, sure. Ernie, do something for me, will you? I might. What is it? I'm a pretty hungry man. Could you rustle me up some food? Oh, sure, Frank. I'll fix you some food. Ernie. Yes? What about that witness that claims he saw me casing the place, that Eddie character? Yeah, well, what about him? He's the state's number one witness, isn't he? Oh, I guess so. What's he got against me? Why is he trying so hard to get me? Well, I think that for the first time in his life, he's somebody, and he's going all out to prove it. I'm going to see him. No, no, you're not. You're in enough trouble. Lay off of him. Give me his address, Ernie. Well, you're out of your mind. Give me his address. I want to talk to him. Oh, but Frank... I know you've got it. You've got the addresses of all the witnesses. Get it. Okay. It's here in my briefcase. Hey. What? Well, that's funny. I, I never noticed this before. Noticed what? What are you mumbling about? The witness against you lives right over the liquor store where the guy was shot. Ernie. Yeah? Just a thought. But he's the fellow that accused me of casing the shop. Suppose it was the other way around. Suppose he was casing it for our friend with the mustache. Well, you'd have to prove a connection between the two men, but... So how are you going to do that? I don't know. I'll figure that out when I get there. Oh, I can't let you do that, Frank. Don't try to stop me. Well, you could get picked up on the way there. I'll be there in a but few it's minutes. three or four miles from here. You're lending me your car. I am? Yeah. Give me the keys. Okay. Here. So long, Ernie. I wish I could stop you because... Don't try it. I wouldn't want to hurt you. Oh, well, thank you. So long. Whitey Wilson, come on, open up. I don't know any... But you know me, Eddie. Thompson! That's right, Frank Thompson, fall guy. What do you want from me? I want to know why you're so anxious to see me burn. You tried to hold Sam up and killed him, that's why. You know better than that. I do? What other reason would I have? Hold it down to a roar, Eddie. I gotta get some sleep. Come on in, mister. You with the mustache. Thompson? Yeah, that's what Eddie said when he saw me. All right, Eddie, what's this guy doing here? He's, uh, he's my brother, but they don't mean... Cozy, it. huh? One guy in a witness box and one guy in a jury. You really got it made. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Make you tell the truth. 
What are you talking about? Why'd you kill him? Need the money? Get out of here. After you write me a confession. So I can burn instead of you? That's right. You're wasting your time. Am I? Get the cops, Eddie. Yo! Get up, you. Am I wasting my time? Am I? I don't write nothing. You won't. Okay. Okay, now. Start writing. Here come the cops. You're dead. No, mister, you are. If the cops get here before you finish writing, I'll kill you. If I'm going to fry for something you did, I'm going to be sure you go with me. Now make up your mind. You want to die right now or take a chance with a jury? Okay. Give me a pen. you understand why I sent for the cops, Frank. I didn't want you to get in any more trouble. Oh, sure, that's all right. <laughs> well, how's it feel? Mighty good. It's a pretty town when you don't have to look at it from behind steel bars. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Well, looks like I'll be able to make that job I told you about. Only a few more days to wait. Where will you be staying? I don't know. You got any money? Enough. Have you got any money? No. Then it's settled. You'll stay with us until you get on your feet. Now, Ernie. <laughs> you heard me. Okay. Lend me a quarter. <laughs> sure. What for? How to buy a pack of cigarettes from a machine. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ronald Reagan. Congratulations on an excellent performance, Ronald. Well, thanks, Harlow. Say, uh, what about this $100,000 Autolite family charity drawing? Am I eligible? Well, if you're over 18, you are. I'm eligible. <laughs> well, all you do is visit any Autolite family car dealer showroom, print your name and address on a registration form, and have the dealer sign it. And if you're one of the 25 people selected, you can name your favorite church, hospital, or any other local or national recognized charity to share in $100,000. And all I do is fill out a form? You mean there are no puzzles to solve or anything like that? That's right, Ronald. Nothing to solve, buy, or try. And where do I register? At any of the following showrooms. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Sounds like a wonderful opportunity, Harlow. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Friends, you can help your favorite recognized charity share in $100,000 just by signing your name and address. So why not sign up tomorrow? Next week, the story of a cross-country train trip during which a police officer finds himself torn between his assignment and his personal feelings for... The Girl in Car 32. Our star, Mr. Victor Mature. That's next week on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Circumstantial Terror was written for Suspense by Ross Murray. In tonight's story, Howard McNear was heard as Ernie. Featured in the cast were Vic Pern, Clayton Post, Charles Calvert, Hal Gerard, and Kurt Martell. Ronald Reagan is currently starred with Steve Forrest and Dewey Martin in the MGM production Prisoner of War. And remember next week, Mr. Victor Mature in Thomas Walsh's story, The Girl in Car 32. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>